Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, economic development evening for uh, the Citizens Academy. Thank you for, uh, for, sh for coming out and uh, being here for this. We have a special presentation tonight. That's why we've changed the um, schedule a little bit that we normally do, which was we talked about before. But we've gone through quite an extensive search to help us develop the downtown. Uh, after uh, a, 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 cute, uh, a lot of uh, RFPs and RFQs, uh, we've got it down to, to one company, which is the Tory Development Group and Richard Heisenbottle, which is the architectural firm. And they are here to uh, talk briefly about, uh, introduce what's going on downtown and, and the, uh, the schedule of that and show you a video that they, uh, one of their team members have produced. So I'll, I'm not gonna take any more time and introduce uh, Vinnie Torrey and Richard Heisenbottle. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Citizens Academy, and, and residents of Sanford, and uh, Russ in the back, and, um, and our commissioner, well, at least one of our commissioners who's, who is here. Patrick, thank you for coming very, very much. Um, my name is Rich Heisenbottle, and this is my partner, Vinny Torrey, and together we represent Sanford Waterfront Partners. Um, you've seen our faces around town. Some of you, I recognize your faces for having participated in the beginning of this uh, of this exciting project for the Catalyst site, and, and that was uh, at the charrette that we held, I don't know, now it's about at least about six months back. Um, since that time, we've been doing an awful lot of work, developing along with Dover Coal and partners, our, our master planners, a master plan for the entire uh, three city block area. And, and we're proud to, uh, I think for the first time, uh, really show it to the general public tonight. And we're gonna do that in, in a bit of a short order format uh, by showing you this video walkthrough that is narrated uh, by uh, Dover Cole. And, uh, uh, and without further ado, after that, we will, um, after that, we'll take any questions that you have. Now, at the moment, this is uh, not quite final. We're still uh, anticipating that the city commission Will and the city will uh, finish uh, negotiating the development order with us, and that the development order will be ready for approval uh, before year's end. So, um, with that, if uh, the folks in the booth back there would go ahead and, and run our video, um, sit back and enjoy. Hello, and welcome to a look at Heritage Park, a joint public private partnership between the city of Sanford, Florida, and the Sanford Waterfront Partners. This is for a new master plan for the development of three city blocks in the heart of a historic downtown that overlooks Lake Monroe. I'm Victor Dover, an urban designer and town planner, and I'm part of a big creative team working for the Sanford Waterfront Partners on the design of Heritage Park. So let's take a look at it. If this is a very special infill development, the idea is to construct new mixed-use buildings that reflect the heritage of the town while still providing for all the modern expectations of a great downtown living experience. Heritage Park is intended to revitalize downtown Sanford further and strengthen its connection to the waterfront. So along the waterfront on Seminole Boulevard, the developers will establish a mix of waterfront living, shopping, dining, and entertainment with wide tree-lined streets, nice sidewalks, and interconnected outdoor plazas and paseos. This approach to the design, one that was common to the great traditional small towns of America once, offers more opportunities for knowing your neighbors and allows for daily interaction among people. It's more than buildings and streets, in other words. It's a pattern. And this pattern lends itself to casual get-togethers and memorable nights out. This kind of urban design matches the real Sanford, the one people already love, and makes Sanford a town where people want to live and work and have fun. On the corner of Seminole Boulevard and Palmetto Avenue, what we envision is a grand public waterfront esplanade and a distinctive tower. This is an architectural centerpiece for Heritage Park, a landmark for the neighborhood. 
Alongside the tower and the esplanade is a five-story residential building. The dwellings there will have views of Lake Monroe and the marina next door. Along Palmetto Avenue, we've designed live-work residential units. These would have convertible ground floors to allow for the option of small shops and office uses or expanded home-based businesses. The wide sidewalks and tree-lined streets and the bike paths will provide safe circulation if whether you're on foot or on bikes. And they'll connect the Sanford Riverwalk Trail that follows the shoreline of Lake Monroe. Downtown Sanford's already a pretty wonderful place for biking and walking, and Heritage Park will just continue that great tradition with streets that are welcoming and visually interesting. The brick pavers and the streets and the sidewalk will feel good underfoot, and they'll match the historic streets of downtown Sanford and visually join the waterfront to the downtown. As you approach First Street, Sanford's main hub for shopping and dining, we've designed buildings with storefronts on the ground floor and offices and residences on the floors above. Along historic First Street, we've designed a series of places to eat and lively retail shops that will light up at night. The idea is to bring home to within a convenient few steps to the places you want to go to from home in a walkable urban lifestyle. The goal, you might say, is to add to, but not overwhelm, the charming vibe that already is here in downtown Sanford. For that reason, the public spaces between buildings are meant to be crafted with as much care and attention to detail as the buildings themselves. The streetscape design is about simple, understated elegance in the materials and the geometry. Heritage Park is meant to pull together a kind of easy-to-navigate, good-looking, fun place to walk. A convenient shuttle service from First Street and Palmetto Avenue to the nearby Sunrail Station will give the residents access to the greater Orlando area and connect the visitors back to downtown Sanford without relying entirely on cars. The residences along Sanford Avenue will have views of the street scene, the Civic Center, and Mellon Park. And a special building will offer our nearly 500 residents a fitness center, pool, game room, community room, and the like. Connecting Palmetto Avenue and Hood Avenue, we see a tranquil, pedestrian-only street that has three-story townhouses with private garage parking. In addition, the flats and duplex apartment buildings on Hood Avenue are designed to look like classic townhouses. Loft apartments along the Paseo will share a courtyard that leads to a second floor open air restaurant terrace. This will be a great place to end the day and catch the evening breeze while you overlook Lake Monroe. 
Drawing from the charm and traditions of historic Sanford, that's our goal. So this will be the catalytic kind of new development that transforms some vacant parts of Sanford's downtown into the lively, walkable community you've seen here. Thanks for watching this preview of Heritage Park coming soon to Sanford, Florida. Sanford Waterfront Partners and the design team hope you'll stay tuned in and let us know what you think. Um, by, by way of a uh, quick summary, what you've seen there, and, and if we could put at least a little bit back up on the screen, that wouldn't hurt. Um, what you've seen there are 238, 35 residential units, about 45,000 square feet of commercial and office and restaurant uh, type spaces. And someone was uh, online wondering where the parking was, where the parking was. Well, there are 370 cars of parking on the site. It's just don't, that we try to hide most of them from you, uh, which we think is actually a very, very good thing. So uh, with that as a little background to what we're proposing, we'll gladly answer any questions you might have. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, the lady in black first, and then the lady in white in front. The, the vast majority will be rental units, but there will be units for purchase as well. We're you know, analyzing the, the, the strength of the market. We've had done a, a series of uh, market analyses by, in fact, two different firms. Uh, and, and so we have to balance that to suit the market and the absorption of, of what will be successful here in Sanford. Yes, sir. Well, right, right now we are uh, trying to finalize our negotiations with the city on the uh, development agreement. Uh, it, is, it is well along the way and we expect that it will be back for the city commission and the planning and zoning board uh, in, in the very, very near future. So uh, with, that, with that said, uh, it would probably take us almost a year after that is signed before we can actually be breaking ground. We've got to do construction documents. We have a, a lot of site-related work that has to be done uh, first. Uh, and, uh, and so um, well, all of that, and, and, uh, and a set of permits. So um, we're, we're really expecting that that would take us about a year before we start. Through the course of this, we I expect that the absorption of the product will occur within, within four years. Uh, that's what the experts are, uh, on our market analysis side are, are, are saying to us. So uh, think of it this way. Five years from now, we should be having dinner overlooking Lake Monroe uh, and enjoying walking through the retail spaces along First Avenue. <laughs> We're certainly going to try hard. So, Yes, uh, the lady in, on the left. Yes, yeah, that's you. This, these particular sites are completely vacant. Any buildings that were there were modest in nature and have been taken uh, uh, and removed before, before we came to town. So uh, this, is, this is really urban infill at, at, its, at its best, trying very deliberately to be as contextual as we possibly can so we're not just uh, setting uh, garden apartments down in the middle of a downtown Sanford. We're trying to respect the context and the historic nature of, of downtown. Yes, sir. You know, Mar Marina Island is not a project of ours. That's a product of others. Uh, we're interested in it because our property overlooks it. We're concerned about it, and, and uh, you know, and, and I think um, it, it is something that deserves its own uh, master plan, uh, in in my view. Uh, but at this point, it is not part of our project. Anyone else? One more. Well, you know, it, it, uh, when you have a residential development that, that is going to ultimately end up housing probably 500 or so new people downtown, um, you need to provide some levels of amenity spaces. Now, certain buildings will have their own amenity spaces uh, in, in them, but in addition to that, we're expecting that we will have a swimming pool, we'll have exercise and fitness uh, facilities, we'll have multi-purpose rooms, uh, and, and, and community common rooms 
uh, throughout. You know, we're even looking to the possibility of having some of our buildings with, with rooftop uh, decks or rooftop gardens. So um, those are the kind of things that we can expect uh, in, uh, in that. Vin, you want to say? Oh, uh, there are a few other little, uh, Benny's reminding me of a few other things that, that, I, that we did leave out. Uh, we are trying uh, uh, to incorporate and we've allocated space for a gourmet market, which we think will be uh, an exciting uh, addition to downtown also and, and something that the residents here will absolutely love. Uh, we also think that it's important to, that we have connectivity. Uh, not only the bike trails that we were talking about and, and the bike lanes that we're physically creating out of the site, uh, but, but, uh, but connectivity via perhaps a trolley or a bus line, we prefer the trolley approach, um, from, from our, our site to all of the critical, and, and all of downtown, frankly, uh, to all of the critical uh, employment areas and, and access to employment. We think that we should end up with a connectivity between here, between uh, the downtown and the hospital, downtown and, and uh, both uh, rail lines, and downtown in the airport so that folks can conveniently live and work in a downtown environment without having to get in the car and spend hours on I-4. So, yes. Well, first, first of all, I would disagree completely with your parking counts. Um, we, we have had uh, parking consultants advise us on the parking count, and we believe that the 370 cars that we're proposing for this site is what this site is going to need. What you're missing is that there are trends in this country that are changing completely. Uh, the, the younger demographic of, of our nation is not running out like I did to get my first car and to get my driver's license. Uh, we have, in fact, we, most of my young friends now are going, I don't drive, I don't want to drive, and, and mass transit is the way of the future, and Uber is the way of the future. Uh, and so we don't see the, the sense of, of building you know, uh, two to three uh, parking spaces per apartment, because that's not where the demographic is going in the future. That's maybe my generation, uh, uh, but, uh, but the world is changing. So we've, um, uh, I, I'm sorry. Um, the proposal is actually to widen the sidewalks. We want people on those sidewalks. We, we, we certainly want parallel parking uh, on the streets next to those roads, but we want people, uh, people uh, out on the street uh, dining on those, uh, uh, along the sidewalks, being able to stroll and being, having room for their bike paths. So with that said, um, let's ra we'll wrap up our portion of this and, and let uh, Christine introduce you to Joe Minicuzzo. Joe Minicuzzi. My name is Christine Dalton. I'm the Historic Preservation Officer and Community Planner for the City of Sanford, for those of you who don't already know me. And we're very happy to have Citizens Academy here um, to hear Joe's uh, talk because it's really important and germane to our downtown. Um, I also wanted to make note that members of the Sanford Historic Trust have been invited and are in attendance. Um, they have the reveal of their images of Sanford calendar on Friday, so that will be at the Welcome Center and a couple of other locations. So um, please be sure to grab a copy because it's always really wonderful. And uh, introducing Joe, Joe is the principal of a company called Urban Three, and they're a consulting company that was created out of uh, real estate developer public interest projects, and this is in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, prior to creating Urban Three, he served as the executive director for the Asheville Downtown Association. Joe is also um, a city planner and previously worked for the city of West Palm Beach. And I could go on and on about um, Joe's um, accolades because there are many, but I'm not going to take up too much time with that. I'm going to have Joe come up and you can hear his message for yourself. So with that, I will introduce Joe. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks for having me here. Thanks for having me in this great facility in this cute little downtown. It's really quite, I was really quite blown away seeing the streets and your architecture here. 
Um, it's actually quite rare to find in Florida an authentic little place, a, a little old downtown. This is it's something you should appreciate, the great uh, oak trees that you have and the wonderful architecture. Um, I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. Who's been to Asheville? Oh, wow. Uh, that was, that's pretty mind-blowing. Um, so I, I did a talk in, um, in Alabama where I saw Christine, and I, ta I challenged the audience about taxation. Um, this is, I'll challenge you all about this. We are a country that is formed on a tax revolt, right? The Tea Party. So show of hands, who in this room has read your local tax policies for your real estate assessment? Anyone? You got a couple. Are you an assessor? Just kidding. You know, it's, it's very rare that we find people that see that. Usually when I ask that question, I usually get like one person's hand goes up and it is the assessor and then no, no one else. But really, this is what drives your city. This is what really was, makes this place work and tick. And you have to understand how that works. Um, I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. It's up in the western mountains of, um, of North Carolina. Beautiful setting, Smoky Mountains, Blue Ridge Parkway, um, bluegrass music, beer. We've got 50 breweries in our metropolitan area. We're 83,000 people. That's about uh, 3,000 people at brewery, if you want to do the math on that. Um, and like any quirky little mountain town, in the, uh, we have men dressed as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. It's your typical little place, right? Well, it didn't start that way. This is a shot of Asheville in the 1800s, 15 years after this picture was taken. Or sorry, this is a shot down, down Main Street. Uh, it was essentially a drover's trail. It was a trade route, uh, native, native uh, a Cherokee Indian route that was taken over by traders. Um, 15 years after this picture was taken, this is what it became. We like to say the three T's made Asheville, trains, tourism, and tuberculosis. Then once the train lines came, it brought a flood of tourists from the south, uh, mostly from Charleston, to summer up there, um, but also people from Cincinnati and the manufacturing towns of the Northeast. We had the second street line, streetcar line in the entire country. Presidents came to visit. Presidents still visit. We've had Obama three times um, in Asheville. In the 1920s, like a lot, of, a lot of Florida cities, we were exploding. We were growing at 20% um, of population growth every single year that decade. This building was built in 1927. Uh, we became the second largest city in North Carolina. Did you all realize that? The only city that was bigger than us was Winston-Salem. Um, in that process of growth, we achieved the highest debt per capita of the United, entire United States. We were number one in debt. Isn't that awesome? Um, when the Depression hit and our books were audited, we thought we had $5 million in the bank. It turned out we had $18,000 in the bank. Our entire city, a little clerical error there, right? Our entire city council was indicted and the mayor committed suicide. That's how we entered the Depression. Now, what a lot of people don't realize about Asheville, they come to Asheville and they tend to think of it as a wildly liberal place, and it really isn't. It's Appalachia, it's the mountains, a very conservative place. Um, we chose to, to pay off our obligated bonds um, from the 1920s. Thomas Wolfe, famous American author, native of Asheville, this is what he had to say about his hometown. Asheville has squandered fabulous sums. They've flung away the earnings of a lifetime. They've mortgaged those of a generation to come. They have ruined a city, and in doing so, they've ruined themselves, their children, and their children's children. These are great words to say about your hometown, right? Um, you know, it's the South, you generally don't say stuff like that. He actually wrote it in a book called Look Homeward Angel. Um, so he was threatened, his family was threatened. He stayed in New York City and uh, continued teaching English literature at NYU. His second book was called You Can't Go Home Again, for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> seriously. So it took us until seven, 1976. This is, here it is, here's the paper, 1976. Here we are burning the last bond. You, get, you, know, it's, you know it's a big deal when Miss Asheville shows up with her tiara and we teleprompter in Billy Graham, right? Billy shows up, it's a big deal. But check this out. It's the third story in the paper. Behind somebody dying in a prison fire in some other county. That's not even our county right there. So that shows you the damage to the community that we couldn't even celebrate this pretty big milestone. But when we did pay off that debt, we tried to catch up to other cities. So what we did is we cut a highway through the north side of downtown, which became the Crosstown Expressway. And the Coup de Grasse was when we blew up Bowcatcher Mountain. This is, this is, we call this Bowcatcher Cut. Uh, incidentally, the community actually wanted a tunnel, uh, but DOT said they didn't know how to do one of those. They didn't have the technology, even though some lost civilization left us this tunnel right here. Um, apparently, that's too far away to learn from that. On the other side of the cut, the mall happened and our downtown died. Is this a familiar story? 
You know, these are shots of Asheville from not too long ago. That's a 1996 Chevy Celebrity right there. Look at this wonderful fixer-upper. Why don't, why don't you all come up and invest some money in our community? Just a little bit of elbow grease and it's all yours, right? We're just, you could blow a cannon off and not hit a pedestrian on the street. Just boarded up buildings and we just walked away from them. And like a Greek choir, anytime somebody tried to fix a building downtown or do something urban, those children's children would rise up and say, that's not who we are. We're not, we're not Boston. We're not, we're not Savannah. We're not New Orleans. That's not who we are. We're not urban. We're, we're a rural mountain town. Do y'all have people like this? That won't work here. Don't even try. Every community I go to has got these people. Um, there are people that did try. The city did take some leadership. It started doing some infrastructure projects. Julian Price inherited um, a, a great deal of money moved to Asheville, he's originally from Greensboro, and he basically put his money to work, created a for-profit real estate development company called Public Interest Projects. 75% of the money goes into sticks and bricks, fixing buildings, and we reserve 25% to seed businesses. So we find people in the community that have tremendous ideas because we want stuff active on the street. So the first vegetarian restaurant, Joe and Joan Eckerd, had a lunch counter at the YMCA, they make spectacular food. We put money behind them because banks wouldn't invest in them. Banks looked at their, their menu, and they're like, there's no pork on your menu. Where's your pork? This is North Carolina. This is a pork state. People eat pork. And they're like, we're vegetarians. So they're like, that's not going to work. Now, we knew our community. We knew, that they would, we knew that they were successful because they already had an established market inside the, um, the, the Y. They're an anchor institution in Asheville right now, and Asheville is one of the top 10 vegetarian cities in the entire country because of them. We've grown more restaurants because of that. There are 75 restaurants in our downtown. We're 90,000 people. So, quick little diversion. How did I get into cities and why does, why does it matter? This is my grandfather. My grandfather is a carpenter. He's an immigrant from Italy. And he was my daycare center. He used to take me around on job sites and I used to follow him around. He's what taught me about architecture. But really, I come from Rome, New York. I don't know if y'all ever heard of Rome, New York. It's up up here in the middle of the state. Rome is such a dump that it's, um, it can't even market itself anymore. It markets itself by what it's near. Check this out. This is actually from the Chamber of Commerce. Rome, New York, in the middle of all the action. So we don't even have action to put on a flyer. We're like, if you're ever in Albany, why not drive two hours to Rome? But the sad thing is, is Rome actually did have action. Rome was the center of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal went east and west from Rome. It was started in Rome. And uh, if you ever sang the Erie Canal song, Rome is mentioned in it with the mule name Sale. This is what Rome used to look like. This is my hometown. And um, in the 70s, we were suffering like a lot of manufacturing towns in the Northeast. So we threw the Hail Mary pass. Like, how could we do something now that we're losing all of our jobs? And uh, somebody came up with the brilliant idea of reproducing the Revolutionary War fort that used to be in my hometown. Y'all remember the pivotal battle of Fort Stanwix? It wasn't all that pivotal. But we had this really inconvenient thing where our downtown was built on top of the fort. So they actually used federal dollars to tear all of this stuff down when I was a kid. And um, we got this. So this is my downtown. We get these uh, Italians that dress up like revolutionaries and uh, run around in the field. And occasionally we get a Canadian tourist and that's about it. And if that wasn't enough, they, they expanded the boundary into this area and did an urban Nulra area and um, did a pedestrian mall because, hey, it's the 1970s, you need a pedestrian mall, right? Uh, put a plaza on the pedestrian mall because I guess 12 acres of open space wasn't enough, so uh, why not more? A couple parking garages, because y'all are going to drive up to Rome and come visit a wooden fort, right? Um, a new city hall, and because that parking garage was way too far away, that's like 100 feet that somebody would have to walk, they built a surface lot right next to city hall a mall across the highway in this crazy thing. It's like Le Corbusier meets the Ponte Vecchio, this big modernist concrete thing that shot out over the highway and dumped into the mall. And it had stores inside it. It was, it was like three times the width of this room. And it was kind of wild because that's the first time I ever saw an escalator. So me and my brothers would ride the escalators in this thing all day long. They gave out checks to 230 merchants to relocate in this project area. Of the 230 checks that were distributed, 18 businesses relocated here. The other 200 and some odd businesses came down to Florida. They're just like, bye, we're out. So that's what I grew up with. And so there's my church. This is where I went to church. There's my downtown. Um, I thought that was normal. I also thought this kind of snow was normal. And um, 
I was like, well, you know, I can go to school in Miami, and there's beaches down there. Maybe I'll do that. So I, I went down to Miami, and while I was there in the School of Architecture, um, I met these two. This is Liz Plater Zyberk and Andreas Duwani, and at the time, they were formulating ideas of new urbanism, which is something you'll learn about. If you, if you want, there's some great books that they've written. Suburban Nation is one of the best. Um, but really, what they were doing is they were saying, hey, Joe, um, we're dealing with this kind of stuff. And this was mind-blowing to me. I was like, wow, people are actually building housing? Who would have thought? You know, or this, this kind of inhospitable kind of environments for people that were just neglecting and just building places for cars. And this was groundbreaking in the 80s to actually confront this stuff. In a way, we used to joke about it. We'd call it a cartoon of the human environment. But the sad reality is it's a real place called San Antonio. You know, these are, this is what we're building in our landscape. Consciously, people are making decisions to build this junk. And we accept it. Why? While I was in architecture school, I went to another Rome. I went to Rome, Italy, and spent a semester there. And while I was there, I, ate, I lived there, I, I went to school there, and I ate right here. And it really got me thinking. I'm like, why don't we think of cities as places in time? They, they have a trajectory, right? This Rome has been around for thousands of years. My Rome made it like 200 years before it assassinated itself. What's up with that? You know, so what I kind of learned in my lesson to you, this is my big preamble. The one lesson I want to drive home to you all is cities are places in time and they're no different than you all. They're just collections of people. It's a DNA, right? So if you want to see how I started my life, this is me when I was three months old, when I had hair. And this is my trajectory, to be Papa, right? You all do this. You look at your family members. You see these things inside you that are them coming at you now. It kind of freaks you out a little bit, doesn't it? Or more importantly, I look at this guy. This is my dad, again, when I had hair. And I've got two genetic issues in my family. I'm genetically Italian, and I also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease. Every minicozy male in my family has had a heart issue. My dad has had a seven bypass heart surgery. What do you call that, a septuple? Now, I can sit there and take this information and go, hey, I'm going to eat some more pizza. I love pizza. I'm going to stop exercising. Of course I wouldn't do that. I've got data now, right? I know that I have to take corrective action. So here's a challenge to you all, the citizens of, of, of Sanford. Who's your grandfather? Who's your grandmother? What do you want to be when you grow up? What heart attacks are you avoiding that other places have had? How can you learn from Orlando? You know, just be aware of that and psychically find a, a, an image of where you want to go in your future. And be conscious to the fact that you have to adapt to things. There are things that you want. You may want a wider street or more parking. But what does that cost? You know, so just be aware of this stuff. So back to public interest projects. This is essentially graduate school for me, or, or post-doctorate, maybe. Um, this is what we were doing before and after. And just, you know, we brought in housing. Housing is what makes downtowns thrive. This isn't to say you all should live downtown. It's to afford, it's just to say, let's just afford the opportunity for other people to do it. You need to make your downtown. If you look at the trajectory of histories over time, 10,000 years of human development we've made cities with people living downtown. We've also had suburbs in all of those too. They've just gotten bigger when we got a car. Um, so our message as a developer is you have to measure stuff, you need data um, to manage it. So my city is essentially a really big real estate development project called the city of Asheville. And it's got a finite boundary of land to work with. You can't make another Asheville. My state has made my boundaries fixed. I can't, we can't annex any more land. My county can't annex the next county over. So those two vehicles are fixed assets of real estate, right? If we look up the word incorporate in Oxford Dictionary, it says to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So there's very little difference between our $15 million real estate development company and my city is a chartered corporation, right? It is chartered by the state. There is a, there is a corporate charter for my, my county and my city, the same with y'all. So my mayor is the CEO of a very large real estate development company. My city is worth $12.8 billion of taxable value. Does my, city, does my mayor see herself as six times the value of Ted Turner? She should. That's the value of our corporation. What's your city worth? Do you all know that? You know, y'all are shareholders in this corporate environment. As you engage it as civic citizens, you also have to know the cash flow. So 
we like to talk to folks about looking at the city like the way a farmer looks at crops. When a farmer looks at the crop, the farmer's looking at the farm and saying, how much acres do I have? What's my crop yield per acre, my fertilizer per acre, my water per acre, and what does it yield in the marketplace, and can I make this work economically? They don't just go out and just till all of the soil, right? So here's one of our buildings. We rehabbed it and made uh, retail, office, and residential. Uh, the city built this sidewalk right here, and, uh, and some folks said this is a gift to us, that you gave that developer money. You built that developer sidewalk. Okay, true. We didn't pay for that. Thank you, city, for the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. That's awesome. Thank you. We didn't pay for it. $30,000 worth of work. But hey, we took this from $300,000 of taxable value to $11 million of taxable value. So the taxes paid on that property just shot up 3,500%, right? That's community taxes y'all get. Go out and buy more 3,000% more garbage cans. We don't care. Do y'all follow that? Anybody have a 401k plan that, has, that grows by 3,500% or a savings account, maybe a Christmas fund? Wouldn't y'all like that? This is how you cultivate community wealth. And people are like, well, Joe, that's fine. But that's just an $11 million building. We've got this Walmart over here at $20 million. That Walmart pays $200,000 in taxes. True. That's the truth. This is my house. Those are my dogs. My dogs think they're lions. We do that to freak our neighbors out, by the way. But um, we're on a tenth of an acre. If you had a one-acre cookie cutter that fell from space and hit my neighborhood, it's going to grab 10 houses, right? Each of us paying 2000 bucks a house or about $20,000 an acre in taxes. Right? Y'all follow me on that? You take that acre, fly it in space, drop it on that Walmart, divide Walmart by the 34 acres of my corporation that it's consumed, this is what it's paying per acre. If you had an acre of our building, this is what you get. So if you're a counselor or a mayor, what kind of cash flow would you want to have? Now, I, was in, I was in Colorado a couple weeks ago. I was like, let me just make it real simple for you people in Colorado. If you had an acre of land to grow something in Colorado, what are you going to grow? And they got the joke. This joke works in a lot of places, and it may work here in a couple of months. Who knows? But, um, okay, let's just go ahead and remove me because people are like, Joe, look, this is cute and everything, but we take the Walmart for the retail taxes, not the property taxes. Let's remove me, and let's run the numbers. Again, we get distracted by the wrong number. We look at this, which is an aggregate number, and not see the, how it functions as, as, a, as a apples to apples. The city only gets a portion of a portion of that. So $0.08 cents on the sales on the dollar, 27% of that which equals 47,500, add that to the property taxes, and this is the total tax take per acre, retail plus property taxes. This is just our property taxes. You add our retail taxes, now you're cooking with gas because we sell stuff too. And when you put them side by side, you can see what kind of data is there to make a more competent decision. Hell, oh, this, this is jobs, here's, here's uh, residential per acre. We've got 90 versus zero. Could y'all imagine if I showed up and said I'm going to do a 90 unit an acre project in your downtown? What, 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 tra what bus or train would you put me on and send me away? You know, we, we, we fail to acknowledge the fact that we've built this stuff for tens of thousands of years. That's not a bad building. You know, it's been with us from, since 1925. It started at J.C. Penney's department store. So some people say to me, like, dude, what's your problem, man? Why do you hate Walmart? And they totally missed the point. Um, I was presenting at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference, which makes a planning conference look like Burning Man. It's the squarest conference on the planet. Assessors are rigorous people, very insane math that they do. But this guy presented at 8 in the morning. And he's up there, he's doing his PowerPoint, and he's showing spreadsheets on how cheap his buildings are. It was like spreadsheet after spreadsheet. He's like, our buildings are so cheap. We make the cheapest buildings possible. If you think we beat up Procter & Gamble, you need to see what we do to our contractors. We make a cheap building. And the assessors are agnostic people. If it's cheap, it's cheap. That's the way they operate. They can't make value. Now, I'm sitting there watching this, drinking my coffee in the back of the room, and I'm like, damn, this is brilliant. He's getting all of his property tax bills lowered. There's 2,000 assessors in the room in one meeting. That guy's smart. Now, the citizen inside me, that's all I could hear him say, is I'm going to pay the lowest taxes possible in your community from the mouth of babes, right? So I went up to the microphone after his presentation. I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? He's like, 15 years. We'll be out of that building in 15 years. We designed that building to depreciate as fast as possible, then we build another one and depreciate that. 
we get revenue off the depreciation, and what we're really interested in is the distribution network, so the building doesn't really matter. That's it. Don't hate the player, hate the game. What's awesome about Walmart is they're very, very smart people, and they are showing you how they're exploiting your policies. But they're your policies. This is your community. If you think it's cool to have a 15-year useful life on a building, awesome. Just be aware of that. I like to eat pizza. I don't eat it every single week. I can't. Once a month, I'll do it. I have to, I have to go with that, that knowledge of that data. So that's just the city story. Cities sit inside these things called counties. We, ha we don't have a great relationship with our county. Uh, one of our state legislators, because of our county citizens, called us a cesspool of sin. Uh, we, we sent him a big thank you card for that. It was like, thanks, that's awesome. Um, so we point out that the average city resident pays more county taxes per acre to the county than the people out in the county. So though I may have two brothers and sisters out there in the county, they're not paying their fair share from our perspective, and they should stop beating us up because we're giving all of our money to the county in support of them, which is great. This is the mall. Why somebody would do a mall versus residential. Commercial property is worth more than residential property. That's the backbone of most taxation in, in most cities. But let's not stop there. Here's downtown. So here's the mall at $8,000 an acre. Here's our building and what it pays in county taxes per acre versus the mall to the county. So what you see is what's good for the downtown is great for the city, but it's incredible for the county. More begets more. So I want you all to realize this isn't complex math that I'm doing here. I don't have a, a degree in finance. I'm an architect. I like to draw pictures. I, I'm doing fifth grade math to show you productivity. Right? It's just dividing the acres into the value. We do this. right? We, when we compare cars, could you all remember, imagine if we're like having a coffee and I'm telling you about my, my truck and what it gets in miles per tank, and, and, and it's, it's the most, most cool vehicle on this page because it gets 650 miles per tank. Y'all would laugh at me. You're like, Joe, come on, that's silly. All tanks are different sizes. It's that gallon of gasoline that propels the vehicle. That's how we rank them. It's the miles per gallon. The numbers change when you say miles per gallon. And we should all be driving BMW Assettas at 70 miles per gallon. Sorry to your Prius owners, but um, it's a dangerous little car, by the way, but it's really efficient. If you have a head on, you're pretty much stuck in that thing. I'm being cute about a joke here, but I'm getting you into the concept of productivity. We've done this all across the country. Canada, New Zealand, it doesn't matter where you go, for every dollar of taxes somebody's paying out to the county, somebody in the city's paying about, on average, about 550 per that dollar to that county. Here's the Walmart, here's the mall. This is a two-story building. That could be in Driggs, Idaho, which is 2,000 people in the land area of Palm Beach County. Or it could be a three-story building, uh, Durham, uh, San Francisco, it doesn't matter where you go, you see the same trend. And it's not a proportional growth, it's an exponential growth as you stack stories. This is a six-story building right here. So it's not even taught getting into high-rise code at that point. This is all below high-rise. So this may be sound, start to sound like a simple concept to you. Some people come up to me like, Joe, this is way too simple. How is it that people, this hasn't sunk in with people? I've been talking about this since 2009. And I, and I tell people, like, sometimes paradigm shifts take a while to kind of figure out. Do you all remember um, the 70s? Some of you all remember the 70s? Um, in 1972, a pilot put wheels on luggage and took out a patent. In 1991, the patent expired, and now we all got wheels on luggage. Some of you all may remember a time of not having wheels on luggage. If you ever saw the Hertz commercial with OJ running through the airport, he doesn't have any wheels on his luggage. Right? Think about this. It took us 15 years to put wheels on luggage once somebody discovered them, but more importantly, we actually put a man on the moon before he put wheels on luggage. Did we not know what wheels were? And sometimes simple things take a while to figure out. So our work actually goes back to the 60s. There's a landscape architect, his name, his name is Ian McCarg, and in the book Design with Nature, he nailed it. He says money is our measure. All right, so let's measure your money. I can map your brain. I can show you what's going on with your mental activity. I can show you your brain stem versus your creative thought process. You believe this. This is data, right? I'm going to show you what's going on inside your city. We can take the city and move the city aside, and I can map your streets and infrastructure, the buildings that are built on those, and your ologies, your hydrology and geology. You all already do this stuff. The only magic of what we do is we split nature and the man-made, 
and we show you your economics as a model. So to go back and reflect upon Asheville, this is how our politicians and our community typically looks at Asheville. This is uh, gray is non-taxable, so this is a big park right here, so it doesn't pay any taxes. So just to be cold about it, it's like doesn't pay taxes, I don't care about it. Then we've got low value to hot is high value. And you see here, this, is, this property right here, this is, this is the Biltmore estate. It's worth $100 million. Um, when Bill Cecil shows up at one of our council meetings, his house is worth $100 million. When he shows up at one of our council meetings, we all genuflect and, and thank him for his time to grace us with his presence, right? The guy with the $100 million house. But it's not fair. His property is 4,000 acres. He's got the biggest house in America. So he's got the biggest gas tank. So rather than total value, let's do value per acre and the map changes. I'll just show it to you in 3D. Does anybody want to take a wild guess where downtown Asheville is? Boom, right there. And we can see the Biltmore Estate here. So when you lay your taxes on this model, everybody's paying the same millage rate, right? Everybody's paying the same thickness of taxes. And if you throw a blanket of the same thickness on this model, where does it pop up? Right in the center there. This is my entire county, and if this is mama bear, this is baby bear, that's, that's Black Mountain, that's 10 miles away, and you can see it's Main Street functioning the same way of, as this model. And again, both those models of urban design are models that we've had for generations and eons. That little Main Street, the little downtown, the mixed use environment, all of that stuff. Uh, we did West Palm Beach. You can see they hug the coast, and their value here is downtown West Palm Beach. Um, this is kind of interesting. Just if you just had 1.2 acres of this building, it would equal the 19-acre Walmart. So why don't they just build two acres of that? Or what's crazy is this building right here is actually more tax productive than that thing. Who would have thought that a little building would be more tax productive than this was at a 16-story building? But that's the reality of the math. You know, let the math show you what's going on. Oh, incidentally, we had a lot of fun with Donald Trump. Um, we grabbed all his properties, and this is what he's pulling per acre. So the Donald's worth about 400,000 400, an acre in Palm Beach County, um, which is actually less than, less taxably productive than one of the poorest neighborhoods in downtown West Palm Beach. This is the Northwest neighborhood. Three of these shotgun shacks are, are, are condemned. You can see the police boarded up sign on all three of those. They're paying more taxes than Donald Trump. That's the reality of that productivity. So I was just, uh, this morning, I just, I just came here from Traverse City, um, Michigan, and there's a lot of parallels in your physical environment and your size and your opportunity that y'all should look at Traverse City. Um, this is the value that they get. That's a lake right there. That's one of the Great Lakes. But this is what happens with the rehab downtown up against that lake. This little building right here is just a little building glued onto the front of a parking garage. 0.7 acres of that building at $12 million an acre would equal the 21 acre uh, big department store. If you cut this building in half, it would equal the 13 acre Kohl's department store area. And what's kind of wild is if you, just had, if you just had six acres of that building, it would equal all 507 acres of houses built between 1950 and 2000. So could you make six acres happen somewhere? And they, they literally have about 12 acres of surface parking lots. They could easily do this. Uh, we did some work in Charleston. And again, you see they're downtown, but they also have a beach effect. This is the ocean effect. So just stripping that out, you can see, what, you can see the potency of what you can do just in a man-made environment. This is a community you can build. Uh, retail sales. Uh, Florida is a lot like South Carolina. Red is property taxes, what you get at a local level. You all get a little bit more retail taxes than what folks do in South Carolina. That's the green stuff to run your local community. But we made a retail model and check out their downtown and the sales that are happening there. Now, yes, this is an older community. It's, it's had all those storefronts. But as you build your community up, that's that retail opportunity. When we go to those big stores, we tend to see large, massive transactions. But even in small stores, you get a lot of retail sales per square foot. And just, again, just let the data tell you the truth. So. Um, Here's their Walmart at about $800,000, let's say $900,000 an acre. Um, here's some new buildings they're building at about $900, or sorry, at $10 million an acre. Here's the Walmart at eight, dollars 900000 
And folks didn't like the architecture of this building, so they demanded a bunch of setbacks and landscaping and everything else. And these are essentially two blocks away from each other. And look at the value drop. So when you don't have those buildings, you essentially drop value, which drops taxes. But you get more infrastructure because you have to connect these buildings. And what's sad is, I agree, those buildings are kind of ugly. But just have an architectural conversation then. You know, don't, don't, think, don't miss out the opportunity on your wealth. Um, let's kind of, so this is some new urbanism stuff, uh, which is essentially a smaller version of what you're seeing in this proposal that you all are proposing. This is just a two-story building. About 10 acres of this would equal the 66-acre mall in productivity. Um, five acres of this would equal the 23-acre that. 2.8 acres of North Charleston would equal the 23-acre this. Um, and if you had 1.5, let's say two acres of that building right there, it would equal the 60-acre resort that's like the top grossing property in the entire county. And again, it's just, just be aware of your choices in cultivating your own wealth. So one of the things that we found in Charleston, and one of the reasons why I was at the Historic Preservation Conference was this history that Charleston has. It's almost this pure case study of an old place in America, which is kind of rare. Um, and this is their top grocer in their entire community. This was built in 1911 at $100, $100 million per acre of value. Um, even after they defaced it, they ripped the top of it off. I don't know why they did that, but they did. Um, and I'm kind of a bit of a tax nerd. I love this quote from the colonists, don't tax me, don't tax thee, tax the fellow behind the tree. This is who we are. Americans hate taxes. It's their roots, right? Um, when the people in Boston were freaking out and doing the revolution, the uh, folks in Charleston, the Tories in Charleston, took all the colonists and kind of put them in this building in the prison. So this is the red coat right here. Um, right next to the prison is this building, which was built in 1686. There's a revolutionary, by the way. That's what they look like. Um, $13 million of value per acre. The Walmart, again, is 900000 This is the guy inside that building. It's the oldest functioning liquor store in the entire United States. It's been a liquor store since the 1600s. He's really proud of it. Uh, ironically enough, he's British. And I was like, dude, do you know what's next door? Like, that was your prison, man. Um, but he's really proud of it. Here's a picture of the old liquor store back in the day. And so we thought, let's just grab all of these old buildings. This building was built in 1718. Every single building in Charleston that predates the Declaration of Independence, right? They're all older than the United States. So here they are. That's what they look like in the model, just everything that predates the United States. Here they are in the plan of the city. So there's about 21 acres of those buildings. Last year, they paid $600,000 to the county in county taxes. The Walmart, which was born in 2005, so it will be dead in 2020, is 21 acres, right? They're about the same size, but check out what they paid the county and county taxes last year versus that stuff. So here's the question for y'all. This has been producing that kind of wealth for over 240 years in the community. This is gonna be gone in 15 years. So how do you wanna capitalize on your downtown? What kind of legacy do you wanna leave for your grandkids? What kind of stabilized wealth are you gonna leave? These buildings haven't always been spectacular. They've had their dips and valleys, but they've, had, they've been recyclable. They've, been, they've had the ability to come back in the community in different forms. So be aware of that. Um, the other thing that we saw, just taking the buildings off the dirt and just looking at the dirt value per acre. So there's, this picture shows no architecture. This is just the value of what somebody would pay for the dirt. Check out the dirt value of the downtown compared to what's along the beach. So let's kind of zoom in. This is the downtown. This is the poor side of downtown. I'm turning the model now so you face the ocean. This is the, the poor side of downtown, and it's actually as potent as beachfront property. God made you this. Right? You can only make one ocean. People made this. And incidentally, this is a new urbanism project which is on par with that neighborhood and the beach. So you can actually build wealth in your community by the design of the place that you make. That walkable environment will produce more wealth for you into the future. Now, I'm an urban designer. I like walkable environments. I like to design that stuff. But I want to show you all what it means for you to make that decision as well. 
So just realize, these are the humble rules of, of, of arithmetic. If you just do the math on this stuff, it'll show you what's going on. And I'm sure you're probably saying to me by now, Joe, you don't get it. I work in real estate. People want, they don't want to have neighbors. They want to stretch out. They want to go as far as possible, all that stuff, right? You've heard it. So what if I could bring you the ghost of Christmas future? What if I could bring you a community where they did this for 100% of the county? Well, we got it in Gwinnett County. Anybody know Gwinnett County, Georgia? Gwinnett County, Georgia, the county seat is called Lawrenceville. I had never heard of Lawrenceville, and I'm only four hours north of it. I was under strict orders when I did the project. The community told me I wasn't allowed to use four words. These are dirty words in Gwinnett County. I wasn't allowed to say the word urban, city, town, or municipal. And I asked why, and they said, we're rural people, Joe. We're out here. We're not part of the Atlanta Beltway system. We're rural people out here. Now, it's really hard to go into a presentation when your company's name is Urban 3, to not allow you to use the word urban, but all right, I get it. I know what you're saying. I won't use it. You're rural people. Well, guess what? Gwinnett County is 812,000 people. So I called up my client. I was like, Kelly, y'all are 812,000 people. She goes, yeah, I know, honey, but we're 460 square miles. We're huge. All right, let's do a little math. What's 800,000 divided by 460? Well, that's about 1,900 people per square mile. Each of these people is 100 people, right? That's what density looks like. They are indeed less dense than part of Atlanta, which is DeKalb County. But they are more dense than all of these places. So as I was presenting to them, I'm like, can you all explain something to me? Like, what's in, what's in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina? Charlotte. I'm like, how the hell did you guys get denser than Mecklenburg County and you didn't produce a Charlotte? This is Nashville, Tennessee. You're 600 people denser than Nashville. Both of these places have a professional football team. What did you do? There's no, like, Lawrenceville saints or something like that like what's up this is austin you're double the density of austin this is raleigh this is Asheville, and this is chapel hill north carolina that's what thirty-five thousand people looks like in a rural environment what did you all do these are choices they made so when we did their model i was looking at it and i was like that just can't be right so i had my guy josh mccarty did this model i was like josh could you turn it on the side so i could see this and josh turned it and i was like wow they just developed clear across the entire county with one form of development. That's like the last farm that's left right there. And, and put it on its side, it looks like a 1970s shag carpet. It's just like the whole way, right? This is what we typically see. So inside this county of Orange County, North Carolina, I can see municipality, municipality, municipality. And I can also find Main Street, Main Street, Main Street. And this is some new urbanism here. So I can see the physical shape and form change inside that city. And it's not to say everybody lives in downtown. There's single family housing in here but they have a different form than this. So here's what they've achieved with that desire. There's a trade-off in whatever I ask for, right? I want to have a full head of hair. I think y'all should pay for it. That'd be awesome for me. I'd be happy, right? There's a cost to that. So this is the value, the tallest productivity in their community. That's the most potent building in all of Gwinnett County. All these places are less dense. So just to rub it in, we put three counties side by side by side. So this is Nashville, Austin, and Lawrenceville, Gwinnett County, Travis County, and Davis, Davidson County. And we ran an economic heart monitor to show them how it works. And we're like, all right, we got a 192 million an acre spike here. We've got a 476 million an acre here. And y'all are flatlining at 8 million. So, so here's a question. I've got all of the same horizontal infrastructure here that they have are pretty much in this city, but I have no wealth to pay for it. So are you guys going broke yet? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. Huh, who would have thought? But that's the reality of the community that they chose. They made that choice by following what they thought was right without any data, without ever looking for a model to ever see if anybody did this before. They just went ahead and did it. So I can throw belief systems at you all day long, but I can only trust the data that I have and I ask you to do the same. So to show you how, what, what this means, in Chattanooga we did this project, this is downtown, this is, the, this is their hipster area over here, this is, where all, this is like Brooklyn. This is where like men with beards down to their knees ride bikes across this, they've got stuff stapled in their face, very hip. Um, over there this developer from Atlanta wanted to do this Publix grocery store 
and was asking to get rid of all the urban design guidelines because they had this developer from Atlanta that wanted to do a conventional box grocery store. So you've got your surface parking lot and you've got your, bo your box. There's the site. In the neighborhood, they already had stuff doing mixed-use development. This is on Main Street here, or the secondary street. This is um, a local guy did this urban grocer here. And then you have townhouses. So you have the ingredients of the urban environment already around that neighborhood. This is a conventional Publix. Y'all know what these look like, right? Surface parking lot, box. They already had them there. This is office above retail, residential above retail, just down the street. So they're already getting that too. This is um, the Green Life Grocery, which is just down the street. A local guy did this. So it's, it, this is called a deep throat model where you have a box and then you put a liner building on the front of it that, that looks like an urban building. It's two stories. So these are all like yoga studios and like, I don't know, dog beauty salons or whatever, but that's like a Whole Foods kind of thing right there. Um, Publix has done some crazy stuff before. This is a Publix built in 1998 in Miami Beach. It looks like a UFO hit it, but um, it's really a conveyor belt to get you to the roof because there's parking on the roof, two layers of parking. Um, this is a small footprint Publix in West Palm Beach, Florida, and, and there it is there. So it's got a pedestrian front, and it's also got your conventional parking front. So Publix has done other things as well. So let's just see if they could do a different thing on this site. So here's the site. There's 34 foot of grade change. One of the things that was kind of mind blowing to me, you saw the drawing. Did you all see that there was a retaining wall going through the whole site? Let's go back to that for a second. This is a retaining wall. I sit on, a, I sit on my community's planning board. What blows my mind is how few people can actually read drawings. And they don't understand the full effect of what's going to happen. And I'm just letting you know that you can be taken advantage of in that situation because the developer clearly labels it in five-point font right there. But I saw that. And I was like, there's a retaining wall. So what we did is we made it easy. We made a Google SketchUp model and showed them. I mean, it's not a good model. It's just we just hacked something together. All of these houses now get to look at a tarmac of a roof, and here's your quarter-mile-long future graffiti wall. right? But what we're doing is we're running the taxes. So that's one option. So yes, Mayor, you're right. This is an option on the table. But what are the other options? When we develop stuff, we're always looking at opportunity costs. What are all the opportunities that we have, and how does it cost us stuff? So let's just do the same thing as a city. Here's if you just did townhouses, facing housing, put a couple of mixed-use buildings in the corner. You still have your surface parking lot in your Publix. That meets the code. Here's what it looks like. If you do a better site design, do what the local guy did with the Green Life building. Here's your grocery store, ring the site. This is what it looks like. Uh, use the grade of the hill and just drive on the roof. You don't even have to build the ramp. Just do what uh, Miami Beach did. Densify the heck out of the site. Do a lot of buildings. This is what you get. Um, back it down to West Palm Beach, small footprint. Mix of uses around the site, big parking in the center. This is what you get. And let's say you irritate the developer. He goes back to Atlanta with his Publix. You don't get that. You just get what's already happening in the neighborhood. Mixed use buildings and townhouse, or mixed use buildings and townhouses. Okay, I went fairly fast through this because I wanted to show you the taxes. This is the taxes currently paid on the site, and this is what the developer's proposing to pay. So the mayor is indeed right when he says this is getting three times the taxes, right? Y'all follow me there? Now, if you just had option number one, this is what you could get in taxes. If you do a better site design, this is what you could get in taxes. If you go crazy and do Miami Beach, you're going to get crazy taxes. Back it down to West Palm Beach in your no-build scenario. So the community really needs to have a conversation. What's in it for us to give away our policies, to give away our desires and our opportunities for you to do your project? I understand it's difficult for you to do mixed-use development. There's some brain damage there. But we need to know what the trade-off is, right? So just taking two of these, what they're proposing, and let's take the Green Life model here. Here's the difference. Here's the difference in taxes, right, on an annual basis. Really, that's not the right way to look at it. And when you get this built, you are stuck with it for 20 years, 30 years, in this case for a grocery store, at least for 20 years for a Walmart. So if you multiply these numbers times 20 years, I'll keep it, keep it conservative. 20 years, these are, the numbers, oh, these are the numbers you're talking about. You're taking a $600,000 gain over 20 years, you're foregoing millions. You all could sit at the council meeting and go, you know what? We understand it's difficult for you to do a mixed use development. We're going to reach in our pocket and just hand you $2 million out of our general fund. 
just to, just to, just for your for your education and, and heartbreak to get other people involved. If they did that, they'd be ahead of the game after 20 years by 2.2 million bucks versus what's being offered. Does that make sense? Y'all get this? Is this too nerdy? It's seven o'clock at night. You know this. As citizens, you are engaged in this stuff. You should be engaged in this stuff, and you have to think of your money and how you can afford the things that you want. You know, when you don't have the Greenway, the art teacher, or the dancing traffic cop, y'all don't have dancing traffic cops here, do you? Um, incidentally, I was in Lebanon, Tennessee two weeks ago. They actually do have a dancing traffic cop, but put that aside. This stuff consumes a lot of tax base and doesn't give back. So you're probably wondering about the full cost benefit of all of this stuff. I've gone through all the revenues. Well, what about the costs? What about the infrastructure? So we were doing a project in Lafayette, Louisiana, and Lafayette's going broke. And the mayor hired us. He's a businessman. He's a Cajun. He's really funny. His name is Joey Durrell. And Joey Durrell is a fast-talking Cajun. He's like, we're going broke. People don't understand. You need to show it to people. I run a dog store. I got a dog store. I got a business. You got to see we're going broke. I was like, all right, we can do it. When we, when we dug into the numbers, it was really kind of mind-blowing that they actually got broke once before. This is, this is the cover of their budget document from 1994. Let me know if you think the finance officer was sending a message to the elected officials. Like, that's the government about to get eaten, nailed by a, a tsunami and a shark's going to eat it. What do you think the elected officials did when faced with this difficult decision? Kick that can down the road. The next year, undeterred, she's like, hey, did I mention how screwed we are? You know? You didn't even have to get past the cover. The third, the third year, they did a joint city-county government. So, so think of this. You know, y'all are, what, Seminole County taxpayers? If your county was going broke, would you just let it flounder? You can't, because you're, you're members of it as well, as, city, as, as citizens of the city. So you'll help it out. So that's what they did. And I asked them, I said, in the last 20 years, what did you do to change your behavior? Or did you hook your little escape boat to the Titanic, and it just took you 20 years to, to sink it? because we're just seeing the same pattern for the last 20 years. You didn't really change anything. You just fired the artist from the first two years and went to Microsoft Clip Art. Like, what did you do? So we did their model. This is downtown. This is some new urbanism stuff here. You can see the heat. And then there's a general spread. So just taking something like pavement. You own pavement. The city owns pavement. Streets are pavement. It's a big parking lot. So taking all of their, build, all their roads and shoving them together, they own six and a half square miles of asphalt. That's what it looks like. It will span from Long Island to Manhattan to New Jersey and fill all of New York Harbor. They have to replace that every 40 years in Lafayette because they're built on swampy, rubbery soil. So just for the sake of the model, uh, we went, we went uh, 50 years to give them a, give them a benefit. It's, oh, by the way, it's also 12 times the size of the French Quarter. 13% um, of it are in these things. We call them publicly funded driveways. This guy even treats it like a driveway. You know, it's a cul-de-sac. People don't want to have traffic down the street. It's like, great, why should the public pay for that? The city has more roads than the county, about two-thirds roads in the city, one-third in the county, and this is how it's financed. So I made the mistake of standing up in public and saying these two pie charts should match. If you own a third of the system, you should be paying a third. And uh, one of the county commissioners who lived out there, uh, this was his response to my statement, it's not about where you live, it's what you believe. Right? The public works director, I mean, these are Cajuns, they're very funny. His response to this was, there's no such thing as an infrastructure ferry. Um, so we had to Photoshop Kevin in on that one. And Kevin's like, they just don't get it. And I'm like, all right, let's cash flow it. So this is the cash flow of their street. So we're not going to build another street from 2015 going forward. So you get no more streets. We're just going to look at the streets that you have and the population that you have and see if you can cash flow your streets. In 1960, a developer built a development and gave you streets. At that point, you should have figured out what it costs to replace those streets 50 years from now, which is 2010. That's the cost of the street, and you should have divided that by 50. That's what you should have set into a bank account back in 1961. But the problem is you kept on taking on more and more streets, and you should have saved more and more money. But that's your revenue up here in blue. So let me ask you a really simple question. This is the cash flow of their model going into the future. Do you have enough blue to pay for the red? No. Let me make it easier for you. Do you have enough blue to pay for the red? <laughs> so the red is 18 times the area. Now what's scary is half of that blue is already committed to the debt service on the bonds for the red stuff that you already have. You don't even see that money. 
So you only have half of this. So this is a side view of the model. This is the cost of all the infrastructure. This is the revenue. You net, this is looking at the side of the city. You net one against the other, what's in the black, what's in the red. This is the productive stuff, this isn't. And this is the model. If you take this whole thing and drop it on the floor, this is how it pops up. Now what's interesting to me, knowing this community, is there are some areas of low wealth in this neighborhood that are still productive, even though they're paying low taxes because their, their houses have low value. That's the reality of data. There are people that live out here, and they told us, they're like, well, people love to live out here. I'm like, hell yeah, you're paying them that much to live out there. That's the reality. So in 1950, they had 34,000 people, five feet of pipe per person, 2.4 fire hydrants per thousand population. They grew their population to 121,000 people. They grew their feet of pipe per person to 50 feet of pipe per person and 51 fire hydrants per thousand. This stuff doesn't magically replace itself. They've increased their population 350%. They've increased their liability 1,000 and 2,000%. And they told us they got rich. They got gas money out of the Gulf, and they did. They got richer. They went from uh, adjusted for today's dollars, $28,000 a household to $45,000 a household, which is only 160% growth in wealth. It's like me getting a raise for like $5,000 a year and convincing my wife into building a 20,000 square foot addition on my house. It'd be awesome, get a big widescreen TV in there too, but I can't afford any of it. This is cash, people. So they have a serious problem that they're staring down, looking at their infrastructure and building it against their housing. This is what it looks like. The average house pays 1,500 bucks in taxes. Of that, you gotta pay for police officers, fire officers, all that stuff. What matriculates to the roads is about 150 bucks out of that $1,500. If you look at the savings account per year that they should be putting into the bank for those roads, this is what it looks like. Now there's stuff under the roads called pipes. That's another 4,000 bucks. So the average house is upside down $7,000. And I told them, I said, I'd be, a, I'd be a fool if I could say, if I would just come to you and say, raise everybody's taxes by 7,000 bucks. That's just not gonna work. What they need to do is stop building that stuff and start building the green stuff to be productive, and then you can do more of that other stuff. So get a little bit of health. I gotta eat some salad now to cut down my cholesterol, right? I gotta exercise. So infrastructure isn't free. The stuff that your past generations have left you, you will have to deal with in your 10 years on council or in your involvement in civics in your community. And just be aware of this. Be aware of these decisions and the behavior driving this. Um, realize your tax code wasn't delivered by Moses. You know, we can change some of this stuff. And it's not invisible market forces that are driving the market. The market will show you where the loopholes are, and that is indeed a subsidy. It's just an unconscious subsidy. Put real simply, if you tax me on value, there's a perverse incentive for me to build junk in your community, period. You're not charging me for the pipe. So all this is public policy. Taxes drive everything. In Normandy, you used to be taxed on your building footprint. And then people started projecting out over the street to get extra square footage without being taxed for it. They changed the tax code. In England, you were taxed progressively. The more windows you had, the more shillings you paid, so people boarded up their windows to avoid taxes. In France, you were taxed below your roof line. Anything below your roof line was building. Anything above the roof line was your roof. People stole Francois Mansart's roof typology, which is a Mansart roof and stuck stories up in it, and they're like, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's clearly the roof, right? It's a tax loophole. So figure out what policies can hurt you and put the gun down, you know? I can tell you I'm Brad Pitt. I believe I'm Brad Pitt. But sooner or later, I gotta walk by a mirror, right? You can tell yourself you are whoever you are, but look at the data of what you are and do the math on it. This was an old big box of its day, but it's recycled. You can still have this stuff, but do it in a form that gives you wealth in the future. Realize your, down, down, your downtown is your golden goose. This will produce wealth for you into the future. You've got to grow it up. For a city your size, like uh, Traverse City that I showed you with that five-story mixed-use building at $50 million an acre, they're 15,000 people. They're like, what, one-seventh the size of you guys? One-fifth the size of you? Probably one-fifth or one-fourth. And they're ahead of you that way. So learn from those other places. Find other, other grandparents that have been down that road. Um, you've got this heritage and this history. Keep on building on it. Uh, this is a wonderful community with, with an incredible, authentic downtown, which is incredibly rare in this state. And do your math. Thanks.